Oh. You got all your. I've got all my. Your, your kit. I've got everything. Yeah. Okay. Well, I started. I, I started recording, but obviously I can cut that part. We're not live. I know we're not live, so it doesn't matter. You know, I can do all the editing and photoshopping afterwards if you need. Yeah. 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 Welcome, morning. Very warm welcome to Gloucester Press this morning. It's lovely to see you. Are we uh, yeah, doing, sorry, I I doing a live test? No, we're we are, we've we're done our test. Uh, we are, we're actually not live streaming. We are recording, but not live streaming so that we can put the videos up. Um, so that if you miss, you can catch up. But we, uh, we are not going to be live streaming for reasons of cost and technology, things like that, at the moment at least. Um, so other notices. We're midweek at the Cochrane's on Wednesday. Um, and then we are moving into our Advent series, getting an Advent starts next Sunday. So we're getting, a, uh, getting ahead by starting this evening in the Book of Ruth. So we're hoping to get through the Book of Ruth before Christmas to give us some time for some um, Christmas sermons on the Book of Luke. Um, so that, that is that. So we come to uh, our catechism question which is very succinct. It's number 17. Question 17. What is idolatry? Idolatry is trusting in created things rather than the creator. We gather this morning to worship the uncreated creator to express our trust in him. And if we don't worship the true and living God, we end up worshipping idols and putting our trust in created things, things that will fail us. So important reminder there. Uh, we come to our call to worship, which is Psalm 97, which is, um, it's a, well, it speaks of the Lord's presence, of the Lord's reign, and it's a, a divine theophany, sort of the appearance of God in majesty and power. And, and this language uh, comes up in the book of Joel quite often. We're finishing off, Lord willing, we are finishing um, the book of Joel this morning. And so here now God's call to worship from Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes up before him and burns up his adversaries all around. We're going to stand and sing another psalm which um, follows a similar theme of the Lord's reign. So let us stand and sing together. Thank you. 
was, but judge their sins as well. And exalt and praise the Lord our God, and worship Him alone. The Lord God on the holy mount, He is the holy Well, let us come before the Lord our God. They called upon the Lord their God, and he replied to them. Our God hears us as we cry to him. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we bow before your majestic presence. We praise you that you call us to worship before your throne in heaven. And we praise you that you have sent your Son our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, into our world to die upon the cross, to shed his blood for our sins, that we might be washed clean. Father, we praise you that we can be washed, that we can stand in your holy presence. And we praise you for this gift of this day, this day of rest, when we can gather together to worship before you. Father, we rejoice that you are our God, and that we are your people, the sheep, your flock under your care. And Father, we pray that your spirit, who was poured out upon your church at Pentecost, might be a work at work among us this morning. Father, strengthen our hearts to praise your name. Help us to turn from our sins. Help us to set aside our worries and our cares. Cause us to hope afresh in Christ. So we pray for your work among us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll come now to talk to uh, the children, the children that are here this morning, and I have an elaborate costume to wear this morning. So once you have come down and um, can I just ask the children um, to close your eyes for, for a moment while I go and put my costume on. It might take a few minutes, okay? Just close your eyes. Okay, open them. Open them. <laughs> hey, there we go. Um, I've got a clue here. You might be seeing these sorts of things in shops and around you. Uh, what, 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 what am I getting ready for? Christmas, yeah. I don't. Christmas. Christmas, yeah. You won't see me actually in a Christmas jumper. Tree. Christmas tree, yeah, things like that. So we will be seeing all around us um, Christmas trees, Christmas lights, all this sort of thing. Now, I'm sure you'd be good at this one. Okay. What do we celebrate at Christmas actually? Christmas birth. Yeah. Not, Not a lot of them. The shops celebrate because it's their chance to make lots of money. What do we uh, what do we celebrate at Christmas actually? Yes. Do we get the book? Oh yeah. Do we get so we get it we had to so Easter, remember the death and resurrection of Christ, particularly. Christmas the birth of Christ. The birth of Christ, exactly. Yeah. Very good. But there's a there's a word actually we, we talked about, there's another word which comes up when we when we come to this season of Christmas. We talk about Advent. And it's actually printed yeah, on the back of the sheet. Our Advent services. It's a bit more tricky. So what is what is Advent? You know what Advent it's counting is? Counting down the days to Christmas, basically. Yeah, you have an Advent calendar, you count down the days to Christmas. Uh, but Advent, the name Advent actually means uh, arrival. It means what, so we sort of we use the word Advent before we talk about the advent of the computer age. Some of us are nearly old enough to remember the advent of the computer age, sort of. Why? Um, we talk about the arrival of a new age or the arrival of an important person, the arrival of a king. And so Christmas, we remember uh, the arrival of Jesus, who was born in Bethlehem, the arrival of the Lord in his incarnation. But at Advent, we also look forward to uh, the Lord's return in glory, his advent, his arrival 
as majestic king, as the judge of all the earth. And so at Christmas, we might count down to Christmas, we might look forward to that, some of you might look forward to birthdays as well at this time of the year and that sort of thing. But actually in this season, traditionally, we look forward also to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory. Um, and so actually this is picked up in um, our creed and as it speaks of the Lord Jesus uh, returning from there he will come to judge the living and the dead the Lord Jesus returning in majesty and glory so we remember that and it's because of that great day which lies ahead of us that we need the Lord Jesus that we What's need that? the forgiveness of our sins so let me pray um, as we come to consider these things and come to pray Father in heaven, we praise you for the Lord Jesus Christ, our King. We praise you for his arrival, for his birth in Bethlehem. We praise you for his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension. And Father, we look forward to his return in glory and majesty as King over all the earth. And so, Father, we pray that you would be preparing our hearts as we move towards the Christmas season, that week by week, that we will be learning more of the Lord Jesus Christ and that we will be putting our trust and our hope in him. Amen. Amen. So let us then uh, confess these great truths of the Christian faith together. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He ascended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Well, let us then, in view of Christ's returning and his glory and majesty, let us turn to God in prayer. Almighty God, loving Father in heaven, we praise you that we can come before you, come before your throne. We praise you that all authority in heaven and upon earth has been given to the Lord Jesus Christ, that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And we praise you that forgiveness of sins is found in his name. We praise you for his mighty gospel, which is preached and made known throughout all the nations. And Father, we remember your uh, covenant promises to bless the world um, through, through the Messiah. And so, Father, we just continue in prayer, Lord, that your blessing would come to the nations, that your holy gospel would be made known throughout the earth we pray that your kingdom would come that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven we praise you for the mighty progress of the gospel uh, over these last uh, 2000 years we bless you and praise you that in all the twists and turns of of history your gospel has been going forth uh, in all the world and so father we pray that your gospel might advance Father, we pray for our own nation at this time. We pray for, well, for kings, for those in high positions, that they might uh, rule in wisdom and humility, that they might acknowledge the reign and the lordship of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that those in authority in our land might establish just and righteous laws which would uh, protect 
um, those made in your image. Father, we pray that you'd have mercy upon us. I pray that you might overturn and overthrow evil. We pray that you might uh, break the power of those who plot and plan what is wicked, that you might establish in our land a just and godly civil order. And so, Father, we pray for this, uh, for peace in our land and in Europe, that your gospel might go forward. Lord, have mercy. We consider the continuing conflict in Ukraine and with Russia. We, Lord, we simply ask for your mercy, that you would be overthrowing those who plan uh, war and you would be strengthening all those who work for peace. And Lord, have mercy on the people caught up in the conflict and particularly uh, your church gathering even this day in Ukraine and in Russia um, and across Europe. Lord, have mercy upon your people. Strengthen, deliver and help us, we pray. And Father, you shake the nations. Uh, we consider many face difficulty and, and trouble and, and financial pressure at this time. And Father, we pray that in, you would be turning the hearts of many to seek after you. And please hold up and uh, please strengthen your church to be uh, holding out the word of life. And Father, we pray for ourselves as we look towards Christmas, that you'd be helping us to share the good news of Christ. Pray that you'd be continuing to open doors for us amongst friends and family and neighbours and work colleagues. Um, we thank you for all the people that you've put into our lives. And Father, we just simply ask for your spirit, for your boldness, for your help. Father, we praise you that you are at work amongst us. So please uh, uh, look upon us and help us. Uh, we, can, we know our own feebleness, so we simply look to you for your strength. And pray that you'd also be blessing the planning of our Christmas services and providing all that we need. And Father, we pray for ourselves that as we hear your word week by week, that you'll be sanctifying us and changing us, making us holy. Father, uh, we pray that we'd be doers of your word, not just hearers of the word. We pray that you would uh, be um, helping us with particular sins that we struggle with and particular help that we need. Uh, please lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Sanctify us by your truth for your word is truth make us holy we pray and we pray also that for for the other churches in our denomination that you would make us holy that you would defend us and keep us we pray for the upcoming presbytery meetings next saturday lord for your blessing to be upon there that you would establish us in your truth you deliver us from the evil one you give peace and grace and you continue to help uh, presbytery through difficult discussions and Father, we pray for our young people, pray that you'd help us to, can, to be raising our children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord Jesus in these days. Please give us great wisdom and energy in educating and helping our, our children. And please be at work in them by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd be raising up a generation firm in their faith, ready to joyfully uh, serve Christ in all that you have for them. So help us, we pray, and bless them. And Lord, um, we pray pray that you'd strengthen our, our households and strengthen us as individuals. We praise you for the many blessings that you pour out into our lives day by day and we simply return our thanksgivings to you and pray Lord that you'd be helping us to cast all of our cares and all of our anxieties onto you knowing that you care for us. And so Father in heaven we lift you all these prayers not because of our own righteousness but trusting only in the righteousness and in the, in the grace of our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Well, let us conclude our prayers and gather them before the throne of God by praying together um, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen.
come now to our Bible reading and to this uh, grand finale in the book of Joel. And we'll find that many of the themes that he has weaved together come uh, together in a crescendo, a sort of crashing finish as we close here. And he's um, chapter, the beginning of chapter three, Joel started a, a section on the judgment to the nations. And there's a, a pro section and from verse 9 onwards uh, to the end of the book, there's a, a poetry section dealing uh, with the judgment to the nations and salvation for his people Israel. So let me uh, read from verse 12. That the nations stir themselves up and come to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their evil is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth quake, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy. And strangers shall never again pass through it. And in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, and the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water the valley of Shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, for the violence done to the people of Judah because they have shed innocent blood in their land. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. Well, may God bless the reading and the preaching of his word for us this morning. And so this uh, final section in the book of Joel breaks into really two parts. Um, it starts off with the Lord's judgment of the nations, 12 through to 15. And then you have this section where the, the Lord roars from Zion, the Lord's presence with his people, and the Lord being with his holy people in this, um, from verse 16 to the end. So the Lord judging the nations and the Lord being with his people as their refuge uh, and as the one to bring um, salvation and blessing. So it's judgment and salvation. And so we come to this, this first section from verse 12 uh, about the nations stirring themselves up and coming to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge the nations, all the surrounding nations. Now, the nations that he's talking about, that Joel is speaking about, are the, the nations surrounding his people Israel that had caused them uh, such difficulty. So he's mentioned Edom and Tyre um, and Tyre and Sidon. And then right at the end of the, the passage of the reading, he mentions uh, Egypt in verse 19 and Edom again. So these are historical nations that have been causing Israel great trouble and attacking them and the Lord is saying here that he's going to actually deal with those nations and bring judgment upon upon them um, so really this is meant to, to encourage Israel that have been pressed down and facing difficulty that the Lord is sovereign and that he will judge the nations and they're all called together into this valley of Jehoshaphat now, we've mentioned this before, there's just great discussion about this valley of Jehoshaphat and actually historically great confusion about it because um, 
Well, in the fourth century, an anonymous pilgrim actually gave the name the Valley of Jehoshaphat to the valley which was just east of Jerusalem. So between the, the, the city and the Mount of Olives, there's a little valley, and someone, someone in the fourth century said, well, that's the Valley of Jehoshaphat. And so as a result, for centuries, people thought, well, this little valley was uh, the scene of the, the last judgment, um, which caused great co confusion to medieval theologians as how people would actually fit into this little valley. Um, there are various theories about that. And actually, pilgrims would even place a stone in the valley to reserve their spot, I suppose, to get a, to get a, good, to get a good view. Um, and it just shows, I think, the importance of really coming to, to the scriptures and, and seeking to understand them and what historical errors, what, what strange things that can lead to. For Jehoshaphat simply means uh, the Lord is judge. Um, and so the, the point about this Valley of Jehoshaphat is not the location. We're not given a location of it, but it's the place of God's judgment, that he will bring judgment on the nations. And so these nations historically that, that have risen up against God's people will ultimately be dealt with. And they were actually, under Alexander the Great, they were, these surrounding nations were, were defeated and um, Israel had a measure, measure of restoration at that point. So it's a, a promise in the first instance just to, to God's people that he will deal with uh, the evil that they have um, been afflicted with. They've suffered, they've faced trouble and difficulty, they'd be tempted to think that the Lord is not in control and here is encouragement for them to know that the Lord is sovereign over the nations. And so God calls the harvester in verse 13 to put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe, to go in tread, for the winepress press. Is full. So these gathered nations are like a field of wheat ready for harvest, or like a wine press, sort of full and overflowing, ready to be trodden, uh, ready for the grapes to flow out. Indeed, the vats are already overflowing. Uh, the identity of the harvest are not mentioned here, but it's the Lord who is commanding. So the nations are ripe for judgment because their evil is great their evil has reached full measure so in the bible again and again we're promised that god is just and righteous and we're shown that he does at length in the end bring judgment upon evil individuals and nations in the end he does act to overthrow all that is wicked but he does it when the time is ripe when the time is ready we saw that, didn't we, with the, well, the account of Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Lord sent the angelic visitors to go and see, was it as bad as, as the rumours had, had been? And they found that the corruption of, of the people at that time was very far advanced. Their perversion was not hidden away in back alleys, but um, was paraded through the streets and celebrated. The cities were ripe for judgment, and so judgment fell. But also in Genesis with Abraham, um, I remember that when the Lord promised, he, well, he promised that Abraham and his descendants would go to Egypt for, for, gen, for some generations and then be brought back to the land. Um, and the reason given was that the iniquity of the Amorites, the inhabitants of the land, is not yet complete. So the, the nations were not, at the time of Abraham, ripe for judgment. That would take several generations of these Canaanite cities to get worse and worse before ultimately the Lord came and brought his judgment upon the nations. And so here when, when he says um, that the, the nations here were ripe for judgment, these surrounding nations of uh, Edom, Tyre, Egypt, the time had come for them to face judgment. So through, through the prophet Joel, he's encouraging uh, the Lord's people, that these nations which have uh, so oppressed them and, and hurt them, even dragged away their children into slavery, that actually the Lord is righteous and that he would at length act to deal with them and bring judgment upon them. 
And so um, this great host was gathered for judgment. Verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And the word multitudes, it can refer to the, the great mass of the crowd itself or the, the noise made by the great tumult. You imagine a great army gathering together and the great noise of a gathered army. We, we sort of hear from our house the, the noise in King's Own Stadium on a, on a Saturday afternoon, a great roar going up from just that little stadium. But here, you know, a great multitude and just the noise of the tumult going up, this great uh, noise uh, gathering, uh, which would be very threatening to the, to the people of God. But here uh, they come to meet their maker. They come to meet the Lord of heaven and earth. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. And the valley of decision is the valley, the place where the Lord will render his judicial decision. The place where the Lord sits as judge. We sometimes use this expression, don't we? The valley of decision. We say, oh, I'm in the valley of decision when we've got a big decision to make. We can't decide whether we want to study astronomy or, or biology or something. Or, um, we think, well, I'm in, I'm in the valley of decision. Um, uh, but actually here, the valley of decision is the place where God makes his decision. Are they guilty or are they innocent? He's going to bring his verdict against the nations and they have been shown to be evil richly deserving of judgment ripe for judgment so god sits ready as the judge on that day and that that is the place where he's drawn them and and he says that the day of the lord is near in the valley of decision and the day of the Lord, this expression, the day of the Lord, which has come up in Job before, it's the day when the Lord carries out the sanctions of his covenant. The day when the Lord acts, um, the day when the Lord executes his, his judgments um, and his blessings. So Joel has, has mentioned this day of the Lord as the time when the Lord would bring his judgment against his own people. Uh, remember the, the locust cloud were gathering against Jerusalem and the day of the Lord was threatened to come. Here the day of the Lord is against uh, the nations, the day of God's judgment against these nations. Verse 15, the sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. Familiar language in, in Joel, the language of cosmic decreation. Um, just as the sky turned black when the locust plague came over that people, uh, over Jerusalem. Here, uh, the sun and moon darkened because the time has drawn near for the judgment on these surrounding nations of Edom and Egypt and the nations which had attacked Israel. The darkness falls and verse 16, the Lord speaks. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem and the heavens and the earth quake. Here we have the appearance of the Lord himself, the Lord who renders judgment. He speaks to announce his verdict. And Joel uses this very striking image of uh, the Lord appearing as, as a lion. And we find this at the beginning, right at the beginning of the book of Amos, the Lord roaring from Zion and in Amos actually the Lord's word is against his own people Judah and Jerusalem and here the Lord is roaring from Zion against his uh, against his enemies against these nations it's one of the things C.S. Lewis picks up on doesn't it this, this imagery in in um, well, all the Narnia chronicles about how the uh, Aslan is this great lion who, who roars and, um, and speaks out against the, uh, protects, I think of the horse's boy, protects Shasta from the enemies. And the, there's, a, there's a scene there where Shasta is comforted by the presence of this cat. And then the cat sort of turns into this lion and roars. And the, the jackals and all the night creatures which are threatening Shasta are there, swept back and pushed back. And there's this, um, Aslan is this lion roaring 
Um, and and this, this language, actually, we, we find this language of the Lord roaring as a lion, different places in the scriptures, but here we find him in, in Joel and then in Amos, the Lord roaring from Zion, uttering his voice from Jerusalem. So it's a very striking uh, image here. And so we see that the voice of the Lord in great authority and power. And we see that throughout the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, the voice of God speaking and creation coming into being. Uh, we see uh, the voice of the Lord. We, we read that psalm last week, Psalm 46, uh, verse 6, that the nations rage, the kingdoms totter. He utters his voice, the earth melts. Or Psalm 29, verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The Lord rules over the nations. He speaks and a, we have a nation falling uh, into dust or a nation being destroyed. It is all uh, governed by the, the voice and the command of the Lord who reigns from Zion. And so here we have um, the Lord utters his voice against the nations, but the Lord restoring his covenant people, Israel. Verse 16, but the Lord is a refuge to his people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion my holy mountain. So here there is a distinction between the nations and the Lord's covenant people, uh, his people. He is a refuge to his covenant people. He is here a stronghold to his people. So the Lord is going to speak in, in, in majesty and awe, and the, the nations are going to fall under his, his judgment. And yet, here is the Lord who is a refuge and a stronghold to his people. He is going to dwell in their midst. And here the Lord is promising a restoration of his covenantal presence with his people. Uh, they would suffered greatly, haven't they? They've been disciplined by the Lord. They've faced locust plague and great trouble. But the Joel is promising here that the Lord would restore his people. And we find this in the prophets. We find in the prophet Isaiah uh, a, a similar prophecy that, that Jerusalem would be purified, that actually Jerusalem would be devastated, but then purified. So um, Isaiah chapter 4, verse 5, then speaks of then the Lord will create um, over the whole site of Mount Zion, and over her assemblies, a cloud by day, and smoke, and the shining of a flaming fire by night. For over all the glory there will be a canopy, there will be a booth for shade by day from the heat, and a refuge and a shelter from the storm and rain. So there again in Isaiah, this language of the Lord uh, making Mount Zion a place of shelter, a place of his presence. And so this is the, the promise here in Joel is that God is going to dwell with his people again, in the midst of his people. And so um, that was the, the blessing in Eden, wasn't it? This, this garden, and the Lord was with his people. That was the blessing of Sinai. The Lord descended to be with his people. That was the promise of God, that he will be with his people. That was what Moses longed for, Exodus 33 15 Moses said if your presence will not go with me do not bring us up from there and Moses knew that he, want, that he needed the Lord to be with his people in the midst of his people so that is what this language is about that the Lord is promising to be with his people in the midst of them so you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, verse 17, and strangers shall never again pass through it. He's speaking here of they've had invading armies coming in. So here is a promise that the Lord's 
uh, city will be uh, secure. So it's a promise of pr protection for God's people. It's a promise of his presence with them. And then verse, from verse 18, there's a promise of the restoration of uh, the covenantal blessings, God's blessings with his people. Verse 18, in that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine and the hills shall flow with milk and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. So the Lord is restoring blessings. Uh, they'd been devastated by locusts, but they'd been turned into this waste place, this desert. But the desert would be restored to being a garden, like a garden of Eden once again, a fruitful, abundant garden. And uh, a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. So blessing was to flow out from the Lord's house, like at the end of the book of Ezekiel, where blessing flows out from the temple, from under the altar, to flow out uh, through the land, bringing life. So there is this great reversal. Earlier, Joel has said that the land, which had been like Eden, will become a desert. Now the desert is becoming like Eden, a place of delight, a fruitful, a bountiful land. And the nations which have been prosperous would become desolate. Verse 19, Egypt should become a desolation and Edom a desolate wilderness. There'll be a reversal. And again, for the violence done to the people of Judah. We're reminded that he's dealing with in this, all this language of a real historical events. But then Judah, this promise, shall be inhabited forever and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, blood I have not avenged, for the Lord dwells in Zion. So what is he promising? Well, he's promising a restoration for the people of Israel, after all that they've suffered, a restoration of his, his presence with them, he'll dwell with them, a restoration of blessings, they've had blessings removed, they're going to have blessings restored, uh, a restoration of, of peace and abundance. And as part of that, he's going to overthrow and deal with evil that has afflicted them. Um, so he's promising that to God's covenant people who face all sorts of difficulties, and particularly through uh, the exile and the restoration. And so as we, we think about these things and as we draw these things through to, to meditate on Christ and think about uh, his work and, and, and the appearance of Christ in the New Testament, what are, the, what are the lessons for us? Well, I think one of the things we see very clearly through this is simply God's sovereign power to judge the nations, his sovereign control over all these things. We see in the prophets, we see here and elsewhere in the prophets, we see the rise and fall of nations. We see Edom and Tyre and Sidon, and that God can raise them up, he can gather them together, he can bring them down. Um, and as we read the Old Testament, we see um, God's judgments, um, that these do not just occur right at the end of history, um, although that is the, the last and final judgment, but God works out his purposes in the midst of history, his sovereign over the whole lot. And, and I think that's just a great encouragement for us to remember as when we look at the world in which we live, when we look at the nations of the world, when sometimes it looks like things just go from bad to worse and wickedness advances, we are tempted to lose heart and doubt that God is sovereign. Um, but actually we, we are encouraged to see that the Lord reigns. Um, maybe you're not so worried about the rise and fall of nations, but you are worried about the rise and rise of uh, gas prices and things like that. Well, even that, uh, the rise and fall of nations, it, it impacts our lives in many ways, but yet we need to trust that the Lord is sovereign over all that happens around us. But we see in the book of John, it's more than that, isn't it? He's sovereign over the rise and fall of nations, that is true, but that he's working out his purposes for his covenant people. We see his faithfulness to his people Israel. In the book of Joel, he's seeing that he's dealing with them for their sin, 
and he's calling them to repentance. He's disciplining them and he's determined that he will have this holy people. The Lord is working to make Zion a dwelling place for himself and he's promising that. And we see that that is all fulfilled in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We see the Lord Jesus he comes as the covenant Lord who came to his people, the one who came to call his covenant people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The one who came to bring judgment on unbelieving Israel, the, the one who came to restore the blessings of his presence to his people and the blessings of uh, his covenant in the, in, the, in the reign of the Messiah. It was no coincidence that the first miracle of the Lord Jesus was at a wedding. And it is no coincidence that this first great sign of the Messianic age was the, the, this, great, this great miracle of the turning of water to wine, this great provision, this great abundance. No, um, no accident that the Lord fed his people so that they were satisfied. The Lord in the midst of his people bringing blessing. These are the signs of the messianic age, that blessing uh, that he um, came has, has begun. And we see in, as the Lord comes, we see the Lord's purpose to sanctify and make holy a people for his own possession. And such is his unwavering commitment to that purpose that the Lord himself went to the cross. On the cross, our Lord Jesus endured the wrath of God uh, at Calvary's tree. That was the great day of the Lord in history, the day when the sky turned black and the sun was put out, all the lights went out as at Calvary. The full weight of God's wrath was poured out on the Son of God and there our sins were dealt with at the cross. Our sins were dealt with at the cross. If you're trusting in Christ, your sins are forgiven. And the day of judgment when the, the, the God of heaven and earth pours out his wrath against your sin, that is in the past. That has been dealt with by Christ at the cross. We trouble with our sin often, aren't we? We worry about it. And yet if you're in Christ, your sins have been nailed to the cross. Christ died and he rose and he rose that he might bring blessings, the abundant blessings of the new covenant, the new wine of the new covenant. And these gifts of bread and wine that we're going to share in later are just signs of that blessing, signs of that covenantal blessing, of that satisfaction that we have. We, when we eat, uh, we, have, we are satisfied. And when we feed on Christ, we experience rich satisfaction. We experience his blessing and he is the Lord who has promised to dwell in our midst. He is the Lord who dwells in the church. Jesus Christ uh, said all authority in heaven and on earth is given to me. Go make disciples among the nations and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and I am with you always even to the end of the age. That is the Lord's promise of his covenantal blessing. That that is a, a, the promise of his presence. It's not a promise that we have to wait to until we get to heaven to enjoy. The promise of his covenantal presence is a promise that the church has now. He is with his people. He will guide and lead his people. He will purify his people. So we see that all these things find fulfillment in the Lord Jesus Christ and his death his burial, his resurrection, his pouring out of the Spirit. The Lord is with his people and he is creating a holy people for himself. And so there's rich, rich encouragement for us in the book of Joel. We hear that call uh, for us to repent, to turn to Christ. It's very much that uh, the book of Joel boils down to a uh, come to Jesus, turn from your sins kind of message. But there's just rich encouragement for us here of the Lord being with his people of his power and his glory so let us put our trust in him 
and hope in him. Amen. I'm going to close with a prayer of um, written by John Calvin as he was preaching through the book of Joel. Grant, almighty God, that as we are assailed on every side by enemies, and as not only the wicked according to the flesh are incensed against us, but Satan also musters his forces and contrives in various ways to ruin us, a grant that we, being furnished with the courage thy spirit bestows, may fight to the end under thy guidance and never be wearied under any evils, and may we at the same time be humbled under thy mighty hand when it pleases thee to afflict us and, to, and so sustain all our troubles that with a courageous mind we may strive for that victory which thou promisest to us. And having completed all our struggles, we may at length attain that blessed rest which is reserved for us in heaven through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand and sing a song which speaks of God's presence and provision for his people.
that's a good hymn, but you need to have a solid understanding of the entire mm. scriptures to understand. Don't you? Well, we come to uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper mm. together. The Lord Jesus himself instituted the Lord's Supper for his church as a perpetual memorial of his death until he returns. We look to his return in glory and power. It is a remembrance of his once for all death for sin, but not only a memorial, but a means whereby God feeds us and strengthens us with the crucified and risen Jesus Christ as we eat bread and drink wine by faith we receive christ and the benefits of his death the forgiveness of sins the washing of the spirit eternal life the lord's supper is a sign showing us christ and his benefits it is a seal confirming afresh all his covenant promises and as we receive the lord's supper we remember that christ is present with us the lord dwells with his people. The bread is ordinary bread, the wine is ordinary wine, yet we enjoy fellowship or communion with Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. We partake spiritual food and spiritual drink, 1 Corinthians 10 verses 3 and 4. Like the Passover meal before it, this is a meal for God's covenant people and the Apostle Paul warns about sharing in the Lord's Supper carelessly he says, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup in an unworthy manner should be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. And he says, let, let a man examine himself and so let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment on himself if he does not judge the body rightly. And so if you're an unbeliever or living in defiance of Christ's commands, then don't eat, but seek the Lord while he may be found. But if you're a baptised Christian seeking to walk in obedience to Christ, however feebly, then take and eat, for Christ came into the world to save sinners. And children, if you are baptised and understand that Christ died for your sins, if you're trusting in him, then this is for you. And this is something you've been talking to your parents about and they can talk to myself or Michael so that you can soon come and join in this covenant meal with us. Well let me pray as we come together to share the Lord's Supper. Father in heaven we praise you for all your blessings, we praise you for your wonderful gifts in creation that we enjoy for our food and our drink and we praise you for this bread and this wine that you've commanded us to set apart and to use in this covenant meal. And Lord, we bless and we praise you for the Lord Jesus, for his death on Calvary's cross, for all of our sins. And Father, we pray that as we eat and drink, that you'd be at work in us, that we'd be rejoicing in our salvation, that you'd be strengthening us by the power of your spirit, that we would rejoice in hope in the midst of this world, that you renew our faith, Father, work powerfully in us by your Holy Spirit, even as we eat and drink and share this meal together. Amen. Well, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And having taken it and blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples saying take eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me well let us come and take and eat the bread The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. 
You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Well, take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you. Feed on him in your hearts by faith and with thanksgiving. Amen. Well, after supper, our Lord Jesus took the cup and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you. We now receive um, the cup. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And he who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, your, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Well, drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you, and be thankful. Well, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that we are your covenant people, bought by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you have redeemed us, that you have purchased us through Christ's death. And we praise you that we are your redeemed people, that we dwell in your presence now by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that we shall dwell with you in all eternity. And Father, we praise you that this gospel, that this good news goes out from heaven, from Zion. And we pray that this gospel would go out even to the ends of the earth, that the gospel of grace would go out from us, from this place, from our lives and into the world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, please stand and we're going to sing the doxology. <laughs> Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. words of blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you and may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and may the Lord um, turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.